Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wisdom Gym. So if you haven't been here before, and this is your very first time, this is the place where we invite some of the world's best teachers, best facilitators to really share their wisdom with us and, and sometimes take us through a practice. And I'm particularly excited today because we have a uh, really amazing guest, Peter Levine. And we've, we've actually had Peter on the channel before um, in our series, The Science and Psychology of Polarization. And Peter is the pioneer and the founder of an approach called somatic experiencing. And he, he also has doctorates in psychology and medical biophysics. And he's been working with trauma specifically for, for a very long time. And somatic experiencing, I think, is really quite revolutionary because it looks not just at what happens psychologically with trauma, but also what's happening in the body and really helps people to process the trauma through the body. It's having quite a big impact on different areas of psychology, but also I think, uh, and this is something we've talked about on the channel a few times, it can really help us understand how to navigate polarization, disagreement, how to really regulate our own nervous systems. And I think it's, it's incredibly exciting to have Peter here. And uh, Peter, uh, welcome to the Wisdom Gym. Thanks for being here. Peter, we've, we've had you on the channel before discussing how valuable somatic experiencing can be for navigating disagreement and, and really uh, understanding our own nervous system. Uh, why do you think it's particularly useful right now in this incredibly uncertain time that we're living in? Yeah, tools for times of terror and turbulence. Um, you know, our nervous systems, our bodies have been designed over millennia of evolution to observe changes in the environment, then to be able to identify what's going on there and then to respond if it's threat with fighting or fleeing. Now we have a situation where we cannot localize the source of threat. It could be anywhere. So that leaves us with a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And the tools here are to help people to not get stuck in the fear. And really, what is fear? How can we work with fear so that fear doesn't strangle us and that we don't panic? I mean, we don't want to be in denial or complacency, but at the same time, we don't want to be living in fear and, and hysteria. So how do we find that middle way? And I think somatic experience is very much that middle way. How is it that we can identify the effect of this fear, this threat upon us? And what can we do so that we're not stuck with it, so that we can help each other, help ourselves, help our, help our families, our children? So I think in that sense, there's never been more of a need for these kinds of tools that have, you know, that have developed in somatic experiencing. Could you talk a little bit about how somatic experiencing came about and, and also what gap it's filling in, in psychology right now? Yeah, well, um, it got discovered by an accident. Well, a series of accidents. <laughs> we can call them maybe synchronicities. So maybe it's a little bit, little bit of both. In the 1960s, mid 1960s, I was working on series of mind-body exercises. And I was working with a group of people who had elevated high stress. And by helping them learn how to relax certain muscles in their, in their jaw, in their neck, in their shoulders, that very often people would go from a blood pressure of 160 down to normal. And so I was continuing, you know, with, with this and, and, and studying it. And around this time, uh, a friend of mine, a psychiatrist friend of mine named Ed, Ed Jackson, uh, he asked me if uh, I would be willing to see a patient of his. 
and he thought that some of these relaxation exercises might be of help. So this woman who I call Nancy in my, I mentioned it in Waking the Tiger, um, and also in an unspoken voice, I think. Anyhow, I, st I uh, uh, was asked to see her because he had been, she had been referred to him because she had first gone from doctor to doctor, to specialist to specialist. She was having physical symptoms for what we would now call fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, migraines, severe PMS, and so forth. And uh, they were unable to find anything that was wrong. She also had panic attacks, anxiety attacks, and agoraphobia, fear of leaving her house that was so extreme that it was almost impossible, even with the help of her husband, to leave the house. So her life was extremely, extremely constricted. So anyhow, because of the anxiety, they said, well, maybe the psychiatrist could give her some medications that would be helpful. And at that time, if you can believe it, there was one anti-anxiety drug and one uh, antidepressant. And they had a marginal effect. So, so Ed thought, well, maybe if I could help her to relax using some of these exercises, that would at least give her some of her life back. So she arrived at the office with um, uh, with her husband, and you could and she had you know the deer in the eye the uh, deer in the headlight eyes her eyes are just wide open. I could see her pulse rate was up at about a hundred twenty beats a minute, and both she and her husband I could see her husband was so uncomfortable, you know being her only support, you know and she uh, being so devastated of having to rely on him to even leave the house. So I tried to explain to them that I would be doing some relaxation exercises and that hopefully this would help her anxiety. So I, I invited her into the consulting room um, uh, and I started to work with those relaxation techniques that I've developed. And so I noticed her heart rate starting to go down. And so, you know, when, you, when you're just starting out on something, you really believe you know what you're doing, even though you may, may not or may or may not. So anyhow, her heart rate started going down and I was feeling kind of full of myself. Then all of a sudden it, it went down and then it went, it shot up way, way high. And the heartbeat was about 150 beats a minute, 160 beats a minute. And I said, "What? What? well, what is the stupidest thing anybody could say in a situation like that, especially a therapist? What would be the stupidest thing you could say? Well, that's what I said. I don't know if some of you can guess this, but I said, Nancy, relax. You must relax. You need to relax. I mean, totally ridiculous. But then, much to my relief, her heart rate started going down, down to 100, to 90, 80, 70, 60, 65, uh, uh, 55. And she opened her eyes and they were again wide, wide, wide eyes. And she looked at me and grabbed onto my eyes and she said, doctor, doctor, I'm dying. Don't let me die. Help me, help me. Don't let me die. You know, and even though this was in 1969, even as I tell you this story, I still feel a little twinge of anxiety in my chest. But, you know, I'm just with it and it moves through. We were talking about, again, the sensations of fear. When you can localize that physically, then you can allow them. They will, on their own accord, generally move through if we feel safe enough. We feel supported enough and safe enough. So anyhow, at that moment, I saw an image of a tiger crouching in the far wall of the consulting room. And then the words came, 
Nancy, there's a tiger. There's a tiger chasing you, run. Climb those rocks and escape. And at first she just seemed even more frozen. Then finally, she started to breathe a little bit and her legs actually started to move as though she were running. She started to have different waves of trembling. Her hands would be freezing cold and then they would be warm. There would be a deep spontaneous breath and these cycles went on for 30 or 40 minutes. And um, at the end of the time, she opened her eyes. This time, instead of grabbing my eyes, she, um, she just uh, was in contact. Something profoundly obviously had shift. And I did shift it and I, you know, I was rather not knowing. <laughs> So um, anyhow, when she, she opened her eyes and looked at me and she asked me if I wanted to know what had happened. And, you know, like I was pretending that I knew what I was doing, but I said, yes, you know, I'm, yes, please. And she said, well, when you, I could imagine the tiger. By the way, that's where the title of the, my, the first book was Waking the Tiger, Healing Trauma, from exactly from that event. So anyhow, um, she, she said, at first, my legs were like lead, like I was walking in mud in quicksand, and I could barely move. But when you encouraged me, I could begin to feel my legs moving. And then I could feel power in my legs and strength as I ran towards the rock cliff and I climbed it and again I could feel my whole body as I climbed to the top and then I looked down and I saw the tiger I was safe and then I had an image of myself as a four-year-old child when I was given a, uh, a tonsillectomy with ether and I was held down by the doctors and nurses absolutely terrified and her whole body had wanted to escape from that horror, that terror, for 20 years. When I saw her, she was 24. And um, she, um, she realized that she had been carrying around this trauma for all of that time. And that was actually the last panic attack that she had. And we did a few more sessions, you know, working again more with the body techniques that had been developing. And much to my surprise, actually, when I spoke to the psychiatrist, he had mentioned, you know, that he had seen her again. And he asked her about her physical symptoms. And she said that, she, that they were almost gone. So not only was the the fear changed, but what was going on in her body was changed. And that was something that I was, of course, to really understand more deeply as time went on, that, that trauma is not just something that happens in the mind and the brain. It's also something that happens, very much happens in the body. And by working with the body, then we have the possibility of resolving that trauma, of transforming that trauma. But we have to be able to learn how to connect with our bodily sense. And so in somatic experience over the next 15, 20 years, I developed more of these tools that I could teach people so that they would able, be able to feel safe enough to feel fear and, and things like that, but not to get stuck to be able to, to move through. So basically that was how my, you know, how this approach began, because one of the things I realized is that um, if, um, if I had not been able to pull this rabbit out of a hat, so to speak, that I could have easily re-traumatized her. And so I really needed to find a way 
to help people without the risk of re-traumatizing them. And again, that was the development of somatic experiencing to bring the person one small amount at a time to these sensations so that they're not overwhelmed by them, you know, so that they feel safe enough. Let me, I'm going to be back in one second. I'm going to just give you a little um, teaching device. This here is a slinky. I assume that you are familiar with this in UK. Good. I think it's a worldwide phenomenon. When I was about three years old, I was given my first slinky and I've carried it with me for the rest of my life. So let's look into the animal world where predators and prey in a way coexist. There's most animals are either prey or predators. So just imagine again with a, let's talk about a cheetah uh, pursuing an impala on the plains of the Serengeti. And so this represents the, their energy level. And so when the, um, when the, the chase goes on, the pursuit goes on, the impala are running as fast as they can to escape. Then very often, if they're, if the, the cheetah, uh, uh, brings them down, or even before that, all of this energy gets locked in. And that's what happened to Nancy. All of this fight or flight energy completely got locked in. Now, very often in the animal world, if the predator is distracted or if they, um, oh, if they, they, they won't eat an, an, a, an animal that's not resisting, that's not fighting back because it could you know, have you know, disease, could have parasites, something like that. So anyhow, um, so they, the animal then often just rebounds and off it goes. I have some videos of this. It's really striking to see. So, so all of this energy that got locked in then explodes out. But with people, we become frightened with this energy. The very sensations that will take us out of the trauma are, cause us to be fearful. So we resist and we keep stuck there because if we were to release, all of this energy would be locked, uh, would be released at once and this would easily overwhelm the person. So in somatic experiencing, I realize what we have to do is open to this energy one small amount at a time. As with Nancy, the trembling and the vibration, um, you know, and the cycles of the, of the vibration trembling and the deep breathing, the easy spontaneous breathing. And each time we release some more of that energy, not all at once, but one small amount at a time. So again, this is um, something that, um, you know, that I found to be critical in working with traumatized people, because if they're overwhelmed to the nervous system, being overwhelmed is really not any different than what happened in the original trauma. So it's really, really essential to help people um, restore the connection to their life energy, to this bound energy, you know, and some of the therapy approaches have to do with trying to manage, you know, trauma with, with medications or with trying to help people change their thoughts. And that's fine, but really you have to get to what's underlying all of this. And that is how this energy, this vitality got locked in and how we can help the person restore their aliveness and their capacity to be in the here and now. So rather than trying to erase trauma, rather trying to not trying to manage trauma, what we're looking is to transform trauma into this vital force, this vital life force, life energy. And one of the very simple tools 
that we can use to make us, to help us feel safe enough to feel these sensations is what I call the self care hug. And the idea here, and, and I'll demonstrate it, and please, you're invited to do it with me. I'm gonna take my, let me see if I can have enough picture here. I'm gonna take my right hand and I'm just gonna put it by my side, exactly. And then the other hand just on the shoulder. And just to notice what you experience inside of yourself. So sensations, feelings, thoughts, images, as you hold yourself like this. Does it help feel safer? Are there any inner movements that your body wants to make? What's your breathing like? Can you feel your feet on the ground and your breath? So these are ways that we can help ourselves feel more safe. You can also just do it with you know, one hand on each shoulder. I find this one is often, uh, well, what, whatever works, it, you know, that's what you want to do. So, you know, it's all, we're all, we are all, all are a living experiment. So, okay, so the idea here is to help us hold what we're feeling. So when we have strong sensations or strong emotions, uh, and we're frightened about being overwhelmed, it's not just that the emotions or sensations are too strong. It's that we don't have enough room in our bodies to contain those emotions and those sensations. Because again, the idea is to just touch into these emotions one small amount at a time so that we're enhanced by those sensations and not overwhelmed with those sensations. So again, that's a very simple exercise that you can practice at any time, anywhere. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's how I started to develop somatic experience, is to really find these tools that allow the person to very gradually move into the trauma. I have another little device this is called a whole woman sphere. And um, when we first touch sensations that we've been avoiding for a long time, when we contact them, it feels um, it feels frightening. However, again, if we're guided, so if we think of trauma as, as contraction, contraction of the whole organism, the opposite of contraction is expansion. And they always go together. Life <laughs> is about the rhythm of contracting, expanding, contracting, expanding. So when the person first contacts the body sensations and they're guided, to just move into those sensations, even though they're uncomfortable, just a little bit, and then there's an expansion. And then another contraction and another expansion. Another contraction and another expansion until we are restored. But again, the idea of one small amount at a time and being guided. Thank you, Peter. That was wonderful, really. Um, I have just one final question from me because I'm really keen to open it out to the audience. But this, this is a question that I know has come up um, on Rebel Wisdom and also in the community. And it's, it's this, well, I'll rewind a little bit. So your work um, and also that of um, Stephen Porges and Bessel van der Kolk has been really instrumental in, in making people much more aware of trauma. And, and I think that's an absolutely fantastic, essential thing. In fact, it's been, I think it's been so successful that it's now trauma awareness really seems to be coming into the mainstream and we're seeing it, um, you know, we're seeing it in lots of different places. We have, you know, people use words like feeling triggered or uh, they seek out safe spaces. And so there's a real, 
it's very present in the culture. But at the same time, I, I know a lot of people are wondering about, well, what about resilience? And I, I think you were touching on that. So do you think that there's been, or, or what are your thoughts on the way that the understanding of trauma is coming into the mainstream awareness? And, and it might be helpful also just to, to understand like what, what is trauma and what isn't trauma? Yeah, well, you know, that's, it's actually not the easiest question. Um, you know, trauma is not so much what happens in an event, but what happens to us in the absence of a of a empathic empathetic other and of course many of us are traumatized in the absence of that indeed many times children are um they um they children young children don't fight or flight what they do is they attach so if the child is frightened, they'll attach to the adult figure, to the caregiving figure. But what if that figure is also the same person that's harming them, that's hurting them, that's abusing them, neglecting them? So you have a very, very difficult situation, you know? So, um, well, so anyhow, now, you know, trauma is probably, I mean, there's almost nobody that doesn't know what trauma, has some idea of what trauma is. And it's probably, if you go, you know, the cereal boxes where they give a little, write something on the cereal box, you probably can get a cereal box now that has something about trauma. But what's been missing is that, yeah, trauma is a fact of life. And it doesn't have to, and this that's, the, I guess, the bad news. The good news is it doesn't have to be a life sentence. So that um, we can develop a capacity to bounce back. You know, you think of a, of a, of a, a willow tree or something like that. In the breeze, the willow tree bends, but then it comes back, it writes itself. And this is basically what resilience is about. And it's important to learn resilience, to learn about resilience when we're children. Well, that, you know, and um, actually in that, in that vein, um, I co-wrote one, a book with one of my students called Trauma Proofing Your Kids, A Parent's Guide for Instilling Confidence, Joy, and Resilience. So when we are guided to move through these traumas of life, because they're always happening, you know, children fall off their bicycles. God forbid they go through a plate glass window and wind up in the emergency room. You know, if we can be there, that empathic other, that presence, and then help them let go and relax into it, then, um, then they develop into stronger, more confident adult, uh, 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 children, uh, adolescents, and, and adults. So, um, so really, our nervous systems are designed like the willow tree to respond to threat, to mobilize for threat, or to protect ourselves from some way from that. It's our nervous system designed to do that, but they're also designed to be resilient. And to, um, to engage the resilience, we really need to do that again through connection with the body with the with the not just the anatomical body but this living sensing knowing body and as we do that as we get practice in this then we are stronger to meet the next uh potential trauma because there always will be one you know i mean getting back to your earliest question we are all in a state of I don't, you know, call it stress, call it distress, call it trauma. You know, again, it really depends because if we don't have the resilience, then we're more likely to be traumatized. The more we develop this capacity for resilience, the more we're able to want, uh, um, move through these waves and, you know, and, and not be traumatized. Now, the, de the definition of trauma as PTSD 
um, you know, that was, well, that was actually only initiated uh, like 10, 12 years after my experience with Nancy. So I didn't know that trauma was supposed to be a brain disorder, a brain disease that could at best be managed by drugs and to help people, as I said before, change their thoughts. That it's, um, that it's something that, um, that if we know how to work with it from the bottom up, from the, the sensations, our body sensations, then we again develop this capacity for meeting a trauma, a potential trauma, but not being traumatized by it. So again, the, if you think about trauma as PTSD, it's the tip of this enormous iceberg. And this iceberg contains all kinds of experiences like shaming, like chronic shaming, humiliation, physical symptoms like Nancy. To me, that was the, 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 the insufficiency in the definition of trauma as PTSD, because that's just one small part where you get flashbacks and hyperarousal, hypervigilance, nightmares, and so forth. There are many, many more ways that trauma can, uh, can affect us. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter, for that. Um, I'm going to open up to, there's some brilliant questions coming up in the chat. So um, I'm going to open up to some of those and then maybe, maybe after some questions, Peter, we could um, go into perhaps another exercise and, and then yeah, um, that would be good on that. That'd be wonderful. Um, and first question um, from Tatiana. Hi, Tatiana. Hello, it's really an honor. Thank you for joining us and talking to us. Um, well, I want to put this a little bit in a context. I'm not a therapist, but I work uh, with people exploring some really charged issues on a daily basis. I work with storytellers, uh, directors, uh, uh, screenwriters, producers, um, well, telling stories, movies, documentaries, uh, TV series about mm -hmm. complex issues. And I get to dive deep with them over per periods of many months sometimes. And there is this interesting phenomenon I'm encountering more and more is that uh, sometimes people will get into huge physiological reactions like states over ideas they are having, over their beliefs. But not actually when you dig deeper, there are no experiences to correspond to such strong reactions. Yeah. Because I get to go behind the, the talk and spend time with them. Um, and I can't, can't make it jive. And then on the other hand, I'm privileged to work with some amazing storytellers who have actually been experiencing some really hard stuff in their life. And mm -hmm. they are amazingly able to stay, despite it, to stay open curious, uh, explore. So this resilience that people with actual difficult experiences have, and I yeah. myself have grown up in war, so I know that trauma doesn't lead to shutdown necessarily. It can also crack us open. So that, yeah. uh, that part I do understand, um, difficulty as a gift. But yeah. this other part where there, is, sorry, where there is nothing corresponding in life yeah. To, the, to the severity of the ideas and the ideas themselves seems to be triggering bodily responses, huge reactions. That, that's what gets me stumped sometimes. Well, I wanted to just say something about, you, you said curiosity and exploration. Mm -hmm. And those are one of the key features also in somatic experiencing, or I think in any good therapeutic approach, is to help the person to be curious about what's going on inside of them to be curious about sensations and feelings and images and thoughts. And the idea that, you didn't exactly say it, Tatiana, but that ideas can be um, maybe not traumatizing, but can leave those kind of traumatizing uh, effects. And yes, it's true that ideas can affect us, but usually there's something that's gone on before that 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 ideas tend to trigger, tend to elicit. So, uh, and you know, and we all have our stories to tell. There's a saying, uh, uh, what is truer than truth? Answer the story. Mm -hmm. And we all have our stories. They're unique 
and they're special. And it sounds like you're with a wonderful group of people that are working with these stories, these narratives that we form. Um, but again, uh, the idea, an idea in itself, it may be triggering, but oh, maybe you can give me an example of, uh, of Let's just take idea. something that is regularly triggering, especially for a generation of, of women, let's say, gender issues, the power dynamics between genders. And they tell a story about it, a TV series, for example, and there will be an issue about rape. And for example, two groups of writers, this was such a clear example of that. Um, one woman wanted to explore uh, what happens when a woman is raped but doesn't tell anybody about it. Mm -hmm. Why is she keeping quiet? And at the same story, there is another character, a woman who is lying about the rape to, get, to garner benefits, social benefits from being a victim. And then right. just having a situation like that ignited the room with mm -hmm. other women just not even considering a possibility that's not allowed to tell a story with that kind of character. Yeah, yeah. I went behind it for months. And what's interesting, the woman who was able to tell that story, she was actually raped herself at university by a friend. And she mm -hmm. had a friend who lied about the rape. So she, despite the traumatizing experience, she was able to explore. The woman, the women who reacted, when I explored their lives with them, they had no negative experiences really with men, not really, nothing huge. If I could, if I could diagnose or, or kind of see anything that was going on in them, it's not that they were traumatized by life, they were bored by life. Bored. Bored. And okay. kind of bored by men, feeling that they can easily dominate it. So they were, weren't really victimized by men, they were bored by them. So this, is, this was so hugely interesting to me to find out. <laughs> no, that is interesting. I mean, look, the reality is that rape, molestation is extremely widespread. You know, I would say that probably at least 50% of women and maybe not that many different in, with men, uh, have been raped or molested at some time, you know, into their adolescence. And, um, but at the same time, sometimes we try to tell stories about what we're experiencing. So we may feel, something may feel like a rape, but it's really something else. I'll, I'll give you an example. I was asked to see this one young man in, uh, he was suffering from really severe depression. And he had been in this therapy, kind of therapy, therapy group. And he went to see the therapist about his depression. And the therapist said, I, sorry, uh, I can't, um, uh, I, I, it's hard for me to tell you this. I'm sorry to have to tell you this but your symptoms are identical to the many women that I've treated who have been had sexual abuse or ritual abuse. And so he would, and she put him in one of her groups. And so for a year, um, he would be yelling and screaming and he would be having these, Im well, people in the group were having these images of rape. And um, this kiss continued and he, till he just dropped into severe, severe depression. And when I saw him, I explained to him that I wouldn't be trying to get at any memories, that we were just to help work with the symptoms that he's been having, the depression. So he also was experiencing uh, really uh, chronic pain in his lower back. So when I worked with the tension pattern that was underneath that holding, and then he just started to gently tremble and I could see tear dripping down from his eyes. And he said, I know what this is now. So when I was 12 years old, um, I had to undergo a, uh, uh, I, I, I had to undergo a, uh, a uh, circumcision for 
supposed medical needs. And his mother was told that she had to change the bandage every day. So she was really completely uptight about that. And so she would just rip the bandage off. And he just, his whole pelvis retracted. But he could easily explain that in terms of being raped because it is a rape. So again, it's one of the things that's, that's important in somatic experience is that we don't, we really look at, um, at procedural memories of what the body has learned to do in respond to threat and to danger and to work with those physical memories without trying to connect them to any particular content. Now, I don't know about the one of being bored by men, that's an interesting, that was an interesting thought that you have there. But, you know, I mean, I think it's, a, again, a, on the spectrum of being bored in a relationship and being overstimulated in a relationship, that really to find a relationship that is engaging, that has a physical component, in many cases, a sexual component. Um, and again, to, to celebrate one's own life energy, to be able to feel it, to celebrate it and to share it with another person. To me, that's the earmark of healthy relationships, of healthy, healthy sexuality. But again, you know, uh, uh, trauma, rape, trauma of rape is, or of other kinds of molestation is so prevalent, uh, you know, in, in our society um, that, uh, you know, <laughs> the education that many adolescents get is uh, the internet pornography. And so that kind of pornography usually has a violent, often has a violent edge to it. So instead of learning how to be intimate with yourself, intimate with others, connected with yourself, connected with others, we go into these things that are on one hand just completely boring, and on the other hand, you know, with almost a violent overtone. So one of the things when I've worked with people who have had sexual trauma, the key here is to, for them to be able to restore in their own bodies, healthy sensuality, healthy sexuality. Again, not just a matter of re uh, erasing uh, sexual trauma, but really coming home, coming home. And I think when we we're, when we're able to come home to ourselves, then we're really able to relate to each other in this healthy, sensual, erotic sharing of life energy. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Well, thank you. I was mostly surprised at, yeah, that shutdown that happened from the head down, like the being victimized by your thinking is what I could see, not victimized by a lot yes. of other thinking yes. more than yes. anything else. And the thinking woman comes I know. from the outside. And the thinking comes from the narratives, the That's ideologies, right. and they take, they, be, they possess people sometimes. It, honestly, physiologically, I feel people are possessed and it's very difficult to get them to explore something because it narrows them down. And my job is to get them to explore. So I'm just, it's yes. just an interesting phenomenon I'm encountering. Thank you. Again, you said curiosity. You know the, do you know the expression about curiosity? I say curiosity <laughs> killed the cat. Killed the cat, yeah. But I say, no, that's not correct. In, uh, uh, in Iowa or Kansas, wherever, they actually have an expression which is curiosity, curiosity led the cat to realizing its whole greatest potential. So again, when we're able to be curious about ourselves and follow that curiosity, we open to new areas that before just weren't, didn't exist for us. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. So we're going to uh, skip the breakouts and, and just keep going. We're gonna have a few more questions and then we'll, we'll finish um, or, with Peter taking us through something and have a little bit of time to reflect after it. Um, yeah. And the, the next question is actually from, from my wife, <laughs> Ashley, oh. who asked in the chat, but got many plus ones. So it feels like a little bit less uh, nepotistic, uh, but uh, <laughs> Ashley, I wonder if you wanted to um, ask your question. Um, yeah, so my, my question is just, um, how do you start working with people who are really frightened of being in the body? So people who are maybe afraid to, to close their eyes yes. um, and that it's, it's really threatening to be in the body, kind of what yeah. kind of steps you take in right. to kind of help them move towards the body and feelings? Yeah, well, that, that of course, of, of people of all exp have, have experienced trauma are all phobic to their body sensations. But in our society in general, we're cut off. You know, um, as infants, we often don't have the experience of being held, of being touched, of being rocked. And so the body becomes a, a hostile battleground or, you know, or something that we just kind of shove under the cover, uh, under, the, under the carpet. And, um, so, um, so how do we bring, again, uh, Tatiana's question of curiosity? Again, that's, you know, that's absolutely, absolutely, absolutely praying. What was the question you asked again? I, I think I forgot one part of it. It's just what steps you take to help someone be willing, I guess. How do you help uh, yes, them yes, yes, to be willing? Yes. Okay. I'll start with, a, this is an exercise that we all can do here together, okay? So uh, just look at your hand. So everybody look at their hand, okay. So now look at your hand as it closes into a, a fist. And again, look at your hand as it begins again to open. Now, this time, not only looking at it, but actually putting your awareness into your hand so that you feel your hand as it is in this open position and you feel your hand closing slowly, 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 slowly. And then again, feeling your hand opening, feeling it, not just seeing it, but feeling it opening, opening, opening. And again, just notice sensations, feelings, thoughts. Does it feel sometimes like when your hand, your fingers go into a fist? Do you have any sense maybe of some kind of power or strength? Is there any quality like that at all? And when you slowly open your eyes, feeling, uh, open your hands, feeling it, feeling it, feeling it. Well, you can do this with your eyes open or closed. Does it feel in some way of being receptive? So again, we're bringing curiosity into a very simple movement. You know, uh, a friend of mine, she's an Alexander teacher. I actually spends a fair amount of time actually in London. Um, and one of the things that she says is that, um, People ask, well, what's the best exercise for me? Is yoga best or is stretching best or is exercise, jogging the best? And she says, there is no best. It's just how you do it. That is what makes the difference. It's not what you do, but how you do it. So just opening and closing your hand that's just doing something, but actually feeling it is how we do it. So uh, John N, uh, up next. I was curious as to what determines the extent to which a sensation in the body is felt to be unbearable. Hmm. Because for some people, it, some people can put up with much more than other people. Um, yeah. 
and some people can get very stuck with states that they can't shift. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, it's a general question. But, yeah. yeah, well, again, the idea, I, I, a term I use is titration. Mm. So we open into these sensations one small amount at a time. That's the key. So sometimes, you know, people are avoiding all of those sensations. Mm. Other times people are going into them too quickly. Mm. So your job as a therapist, mm. as a guide, is to help restrain them from going in too quickly yeah. and to <clears throat> also notice when they're avoidant and to gently bring your attention back yeah. to the body sensations. But again, in a titrated way, in a small, small, smallest amount of exposure to those mm. different sensations. But but the therapist's countertransference is very central to that, isn't it? The the the, the, the countertransference of the therapist is very central to that, isn't it? Yeah, countertransference. Actually, what I, I think more in terms of uh, a countertransference for sh is true there, but of what I call somatic resonance. Right. Mm. So when we're in contact with a client, we will be feeling something like mm. what they're feeling. Mm. So we can use that to help guide them. Yeah. You know, but again, we have to be careful about that yeah. because, you know, again, that's our sensations. Mm. And, and th they, they could be closely allied to what the person is feeling mm. or not. But yeah. it often guides us yeah. ourselves as therapists, yeah. being able to say, hmm. so for example, you're really feeling your shoulders tighten and tighten yeah. and tighten. Yeah. And so you might just say, I'm just wondering to the client, yeah. I'm just wondering what you're noticing in your shoulders right now. Yeah. So, and again, it's not just what you feel in your shoulders, yeah. but also what you're seeing in the person's shoulders. So it's putting them together, yeah. your observational skills, yeah with yeah with with what you're resonating with yes, yes. You know, sometimes that's called projective identification mm, 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 and but mm. again if we look at if we deconstruct that it really is that we're resonating with something that they're feeling but are unable to feel mm. so we can sometimes use our yes. sensation to help move them yes yes or to wait i suppose or to wait. I, exactly. A lot of times it's about waiting. Mm. I was just doing a webinar for um, Diane Heller. She does a lot of really, really good online stuff. And I was working with this young man, actually uh, from your part of the world, Angus. And he, he just completely goes in his head. Mm. But gradually, Little and again, he has the most horrendous trauma, you know, tremendous amount of neglect. And then when he was two years old, he was hit by a car and was in coma. I mean, one thing after another, after another, after another. And we got to a place where he didn't need to explain to himself what he was feeling. And so I just shut my mouth and listened show up, shut up and listen. Mm. And quietly, I just would be with my body. And I don't know how long it was, in, you know, in real, real time. But the two of us were just there in quietude. Mm. Mm. And you could see that was a real fundamental shift mm. in his being. Mm. But again, it has to do with knowing when to ask questions and when yes. to keep your mouth shut. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So we, we probably have time for a couple more questions before we, we finish with an exercise. But uh, Julia Carmo, you asked a great question um, that's been popular in the chat. I wonder <clears> if you would like to ask it to Peter now. Hi, Peter. Thanks so much. This is really interesting. Sure. It's, a, it's a lay person question and it's a <clears throat> question uh, about COVID and the anxiety that it provokes. Mm. Uh, it's uh, something that I was surprised how quickly I felt myself when, you know, the new lockdown measures have been announced and, you know, Europe's gone into this isolation. And, you know, when it's a confluence of anxieties about everything, you know, it's isolation, 
and yeah. lack of comfort. It's everything from, you know, fears for health, fears for relatives, financial security, all of these things. Yeah. What What would be your yeah. advice? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, COVID is bringing us to a whole different level of anxiety. Uh, and also to loss and to grief. And here in the North America, in the United States, um, we don't do well with grief. You know, uh, we're supposed to be up and buoyant and, you know, on top of things. And so grief represents for many people a, a weakness, but it's not. It's a critical strength. And you on the other side of the pond, you know, stiff upper lip, that kind of thing, you know, is also a way of avoiding grief, grief and sorrow. Because of course, some people have lost friends, have lost loved ones who have died. Grief, we've given up things that were important to us in our lives like engaging with other people, being with other people, being with friends, sharing meals together. And we've lost much of that. I mean, we can do some of that online, of course, and that's important. You know, when they talk about social distancing, I wanna pull my hair out because it's really, it's the wrong term. It's not about social distancing, it's about physical distancing with social connection. There was a wonderful video, and I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. Uh, in, uh, I think it was in Assisi, in, in, uh, when the first lockdown was happening in, in Italy. And so this one person comes out on the balcony and he's playing his guitar. Somebody goes on their balcony, they're playing an accordion. An old, older couple, it has two pots and hands in their hands and they're banging them together. So they are physically distanced, but they are socially connecting. We need social connection. Our nervous systems are designed to co-participate with others, people's nervous system. So, um, so it's really important that we do things like when we're with friends and, and we're able to even do something like this, which is like a Zoom, kind of thing, to be with people, to be able to start to open to our, our feelings. And again, with grief, grief is a, is a difficult emotion, difficult for most people. So-called primitive people are able to deal with that much more effectively. I'm thinking about some particular tribes, the, uh, the forest people in Nubia, uh, Africa. And, and this is true in, in, I've seen in different cultures where I've been that um, when somebody dies or has fallen ill, the family member, the, the, the group meets together, the tribe meets together and they mourn together, they cry together. And this goes on, you know, all day and all night. Then the next day they move into the forest and they do dance, they dance together in ecstatic dancing. So it's again, grief is something that is meant to be shared. But when we're isolated, that also limits our capacity to our ability to contact our grief and to allow it to move through, to let the tears flow. So again, I think that's something that we can help do with each other. You know, this is, serious stuff you know there is isolation there's lockdown there's illness and there's even death but if we're able to contact those sensations and be able to feel the grief and allow the grief to come into its to its being to its fullness not grief that's overwhelming but grief that's we're all sharing we're just all sharing together. I remember I was um, uh, had the privilege to be with a tribe in a fairly remote area in Brazil. And um, 
uh, I was welcomed by the by the uh, the chief, and um, I asked him, uh, you know, if he was familiar with sustus, which is the Portuguese name for trauma, which it means fright, paralysis, or soul loss. And he said, yes, he knows he knows about that. He even knows about the word trauma. He said, but you have to understand something. And basically what he told me is something that I've held dear, dearly. He said that what happens is when the, when the, the society, the tribe has been broken, that's when we're susceptible to trauma. So those, his, their native land was taken over by the farmers and the loggers. They, when, when they finally won in the courts to come back to their land, the farmers burned all of that, the forests. And so they had to very slowly reestablish the fauna and the, uh, the you know, the, the, uh, what's the fauna and the, what's the word I'm looking for? Flora. Flora and the fauna, yes. So anyhow, uh, you know, they did that. And then there was this one woman uh, who was pregnant and with twins and she was diabetic. So it was a high risk pregnancy. So they took her to the ho nearest hospital, which was about three hours away. And um, the, uh, the, the, uh, they, they were still born. And so she went again into a profound depression and they were gonna give her electric shock treatment, electric shock therapy. So the, um, the princess, the daughter of the chief and some of the people in the middle of the night went to the hospital and they fashioned a, a ladder and they climbed up to the room, the window of her room and they brought her back and uh, back to the, to the tribe. And they do a, a, a dance, which is quite astonishing when they, when they, I participated with them. It's a very simple step, you know, and you just repeat this, these steps and you really go into an altered state of consciousness, a, a connected state of consciousness with all the people who are in the circle. And so they brought this woman back and she did not, in, would, would not engage in that. She just sat off in, in a corner and she did that for several nights. Then on the fifth or sixth night, she just started, to, I think somebody in the, in the tribe started to cry and then she started to cry and then everybody was crying. And then the depression lifted. But again, we really need community. We need our social nervous systems to be engaged. And when we can't do that, because that actually helps buffer us, that gives us greater resilience. So when we're unable to do that, what is what really should be natural, then we tend to be more affected by fear and, and shut down. Is that helpful? Very much so, thank you. Beautiful, thank you. We have time for, for just one more question. And um, so, um, uh, Charlie, are you, are you with us? Are you able to ask your question to Peter? Thank you, yes. Um, thank you, Peter, for an absolutely incredible um, yeah, share there. Uh, I guess I'm, yeah, I'm deeply curious and I'd love to hear. Um, Interesting, it, it almost... you just did, Charlie. You just did this with your hand. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Can you be curious about that? <laughs> I hope it's a, I hope it's a positive sign. Um, well, let's see. Let's see what it yeah. feels like. It yeah. felt like I was leaning in, but like yeah, maybe like I was leaning in. Le leaning um, in, yes. So leaning in with your question. So go cool. fine. Continue with your question. Um. Yeah, so I would, I, w I would really, it feels almost as if the field of psychotherapy is going through somewhat of a revolution, I hope, um, with your ideas becoming more and more popular, as well as like psychedelics, mm -hmm. um, and 
some psychiatric research actually seems quite mm -hmm. hopeful. So I'm really curious what your kind of vision or hope is for the future of this field um, and what that yeah. might look like. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't mean just to toot my horn, but over the past, starting in 2010, um, I, I, again, feeling your hands and just noticing if you're feeling more interest, more curiosity, more receptivity, perhaps. So anyhow, during that time, I received three Lifetime Achievement Awards um, for you know, the work that I've done over the, over the decades. The last one, which was this, um, this past March, uh, was from the Psychotherapy Network. And that was when I gave my acceptance speech, you know, I said, this is really not about me, not just about me. It's about a revolution, an evolution, a revolution that's occurring in the field, not only of psychotherapy, but of all kinds of healing methods. And that it's bringing in the body. And that's what's been missing in psychotherapy that and so i received this as a indication that this was no longer fringe but this is now moved into the mainstream and will continue there's no turning back you know therapy will be forever changed by the recognition of people who have worked and i think of my uh, colleague um eugene jenlin who who died several years ago you know, his, his development of the concept of felt sense, you know, and, and other people in Buddhism, for example, different tantric forms of Buddhism, and my work and other work of people in body-oriented psychotherapy. And you talked about psychedelics. I think they're also very valuable in many cases, but they're, you know, um, but we also have to look at, there are also some um, downsides that we have to be careful about. You know, and um, one of the things about use of psychedelics, again, is that the person isn't overwhelmed. So you have to make sure the person is ready to be able to do something, something like this. And um, also, you know, psychedelics can open certain doors, but they don't necessarily take you through the door and navigate on the other side of the door. And we need to do our own work. The other thing is because psychedelics happen in an, in an altered state of consciousness, we have to bridge that consciousness in the non-drug state. So again, it's, we're at the very infancy. I mean, actually in the 1970s, um, you know, I was working with MDMA you know, with, with some of my clients. It was legal at that time. And, um, you know, it, it really opened up a lot of my vistas, uh, you know, and, but again, I, I realize also that we, ha it's something that we have to also work with without using those catalysts. They are catalysts and they're powerful catalysts and they all have somewhat similar, many have similar effects, but they also have different effects. So again, this is just the beginning. And so some of us, you know, who were, in the in the 60s, hippies in the 60s, were really chuckling because on the news, you know, one uh, psilocybin is accepted, uh, DMT ayahuasca is now being accepted, MDMA is now being accepted, LSD is being reaccepted, and so forth. So all of these things are now being used, and I think this is important because we need more. Again, that I said, it's not about racing trauma, but about our connecting to our core self and the body-oriented therapies and, uh, and uh, psychedelics to some degree, because many psychedelics are dissociative. So again, it's important that people have some body sense and then also bring the psychedelic experience into the body. Some tend to have more bodily sensations than others. So, oh, so I guess I'm going on here. So again, I hope that gives you some idea of you know, that, that the corner have been turned. This is no longer fringe. This is now in the mainstream, period.
Yeah. Thank you so much, Peter. That was brilliant. Sure. Really loved yeah. Amen. Great. Thank you, Peter. And we have we have just about 10 minutes left. So we would be really honored and very happy if you if you might take us through another one of uh, your exercises. Okay. Well, we were talking about connecting to our deep self. And um, oh, there's also an interesting physiological phenomenon I'll explain hopefully in less than two minutes. If we see something that's, we walk out and somebody's hit by a car or something like that, you know, our guts twist and we go, ugh. That's because there's a nerve that goes from the brain, the brain stem, the vagus nerve down through the diaphragm and enervates all of the, mo I think almost all the organs in the, in the viscera, especially the gastrointestinal system. So we see something that's, that's horrible or, and our, our guts twist. Now, this nerve, which is the largest nerve in the body, is 80% sensory. So it's not just what's going from the brain to the, to the viscera and, and to the heart and the lung, but it's also what's being transmitted back from the guts back into the brain. So we see this and we go, yuck. So that yuck sensation actually gets transmitted back up to the brain where it's amplified. So we go yuck and ugh. And then after soon our whole system is shut down and we're, we've lost our energy, our aliveness. So the idea in this exercise is to allow new signals to come from the viscera that contradict those of that yucky, yucky shut down. And the exercise is simply to take an easy full breath, and I'll demonstrate it and we can do it together. An easy full breath, and on the exhalation, making the sound voo, v, v, as though it's coming from our bellies, and allow the sound and the breath to go all the way out. And then just wait, just allow the new breath to come in, filling our belly and into our chest, and then again repeating. So I'll demonstrate. And letting the breath and the sound go all the way out. And then awaiting, allowing the breath to come in. Good. And just sensing your body and just looking around in your environment, in your homes or wherever you are. Seeing if there's something that catches your attention, something that's special to you in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Just noticing how your hands feel. You noticing any tingling or any vibration in your feet, how your feet feel. Can you feel them on the ground? What do you notice in your belly? You may feel any warmth or tingling or vibration there. Again, just engaging curiosity. So, anybody want to just, or anybody just pipe in a little bit and just say quickly what you notice what your experience is in doing the exercise. Just, yeah, one, one comment, um, and it may be re related back to what you were saying about contracting and expanding and then contracting. I definitely felt that motion, like from a contraction to a slight expansion and then a contraction again. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, yes. Okay, anybody else? So it is for me, I noticed that it became like it, I felt more depth of everything that I was seeing and um, are you, are you my sensations up? also had. Oh, sorry. Mm. Can you hear me now? Yeah, better, better. Not really. Yeah. So that there's more depth in everything I'm seeing and sensing. Ah, more depth, more clarity. Yeah. Like the colors are sometimes more bright contrast, more contrast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, so within, so without. 
what we feel inside determines exactly how we will see our world. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. I just have a, a brief follow up. Is the vibration, is it the vibration, does that have something to do with it? I felt a very strong vibration just in doing that sound. Yes, the, it exactly is. The vibration is vibrating those receptors that are in the viscera, that are in the guts, so that you can send a new signal back up to the brain that says, all is okay. Yeah. yeah exactly. Adriana, I think there's a whole theory about why that is sound indeed. Yes, I mean, sounds have been used for thousands of years, maybe for tens of thousands of years. I mean, if you look in, at primitive instruments and people have chanted together. And, you know, and, and even in, in the Christian church, people sing together. Uh, and in, in many religious settings and spiritual settings. We sing, we make voice. And, um, but this, this particular sound is also specific for working with this connection with our guts, but if, of, of altering that feedback uh, where we are feeling worse and worse and worse and saying, because you know, one of the things about healing trauma is to be able to create new experiences in our bodies, experiences that contradict those of fear and shutdown and overwhelming helplessness. And this is one exercise that allows us to shift out of the shutdown and to be able to pendulate and to be able to feel more aliveness. I know I've said this now at least half a dozen times because the goal of, for me, the goal of successful trauma therapy is to restore the person's resilience and their sense of aliveness. Okay, so I guess we're coming right now to about to the end here, huh? We are indeed, and, and that feels like a really lovely place to end on that, on that note of aliveness and, and resilience. Peter, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing sure. all of your wisdom with us. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>